Good afternoon and welcome to MedTech Crossroads. Today's episode 56, Friday, April 7th of 2021. Today we have our COVID news as always. After that is going to be John Freshly from Fresh Venture Development and many, many more, a local entrepreneur. Uh, Medical Device Development Month, the month of May here at MedTech Crossroads. We're going to be talking today about the real meaning of development iteration. After that, we will have Q&A and much, much more after that. Uh, but first off, I'm going to go to some of the news. And the first news of that is actually personal. We're going to see how today's show goes with very little sleep this week because our family was very thankful to welcome one Samuel Peranek into the world. He was born at home this week. And I thought I'd bring him up in part because our friends at Mott's Children's Hospital here in Ann Arbor, Michigan, some of the wonderful folks there, were able to help us out when he had some complications in his second day of life. And so we are very grateful to those folks at Mott Children's Hospital and all the wonderful healthcare systems across our state, many of whom uh, we talk with on this show. Uh, so if you're listening to it today and you're in our healthcare systems, thank you from our family to yours. We're going to talk next about COVID metrics, as we always do. These from covid.cdc.gov. The state of Michigan, the transmission rate is finally barely imperceptibly starting to come down. This was a complete red block as of last week, which was probably the peak of transmission from what we can see from the CDC's data. Uh, COVID spreading pretty much unrestricted across the state of Michigan. Uh, Kind of in contrast to the rest of the country, there's a lot of high transmission, uh, but we certainly have had some of the worst of it. Also, some of the worst of the hospitalizations, those are coming down. I can confirm when we were in the hospital, they they were talking about how few beds they had and how busy the hospital was. Um, And so right now, Michigan, for I think it's the fourth or fifth week in a row, uh, sadly dead last in the country in terms of hospitalizations. Uh, So we hope that those numbers turn around. I think they are because we're seeing that red sort of mitigate on this graph. Uh, We're also seeing the new cases drop off, um, even though the number of tests continues to climb, the positivity rate is dropping. Thankfully, the deaths appear to have peaked, uh, not insignificant number of deaths, thankfully not as high as during the fall and winter. So uh, good news, although it's still affecting many families and um, our heart goes out to those who have been lost even in these later uh, waves. Here's what it looks like in terms of the demographic. As we've been noting, it's really those 40 through 69 year olds that are carrying this wave in comparison to the older uh, generation that was in the first wave that we saw in the fall. And uh, the good news is that for the last few weeks, this also has been coming down. This again, hospital admissions as a representative number of the impact of the pandemic. Well, there's definitely a trend in the world of vaccinations. You've heard all about it. And of course, you can see it here in the bottom right, the vaccinations trending downward pretty dramatically, uh, seems to have reached a peak uh, in the beginning of April and now dropping off uh, the country. um, Different states of vaccination, um, Michigan certainly not leading the way. Interestingly, uh, some real density there in the Northeast and uh, in the upper Midwest, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, et cetera. That is the COVID news. I wanna tell you also about the Ann Arbor Biosocial, a monthly gathering of the Ann Arbor area biotech community. Matthew Himes, of course, has been on the show. The next installment of that is coming up. It's presented by Mish Bio, Ann Arbor Spark, and MyLead Consulting. The next gathering will be virtual at Tuesday, May 11th, Uh, That's next week, Tuesday, from 5 to 7 p.m. If you want to be a part of that, you can register at mishbio.org slash events. It's been really fun. I've been to a few of those, and they are great uh, events, Uh, even better in person. We really enjoyed those a couple of years ago. Hopefully, we'll get back to that eventually. Uh, But right now, you can join Biosocial next Tuesday, May 11th, through mishbio.org slash events. And since our newest son isn't ready to uh, take this job, we're still looking for an embedded systems developer, microcontroller firmware and user interface software development and system design. Uh, Still, that position remains open. And so submit resumes and contacts 
uh, to us here at Into Being, you can send them to info at intobeing.com. Another reminder about our quarterly pitch party coming up at the end of June, $2,500 prize. Our judges, Andy, Nikki, Jim, and Stacy, uh, they'll actually be back with us at the end of May for an educational segment before we get to the judging at the end of June. And as always, if you know of startups that want to be part of this, they just have to be med tech startups anywhere in the United States. They get 10 minutes at the end of an upcoming show to pitch. The uh, pitches should have areas of problem statement, vision, value proposition, team, milestones, business model, competitors, and their ask. And we're going to get a few of those startups. We're going to put them together. And as always, our judges will reflect on what they liked, what they didn't like, and ultimately tip their hat towards one winner. Another reminder that on the, on the Into Being website, you can now get to this section under webinars for the FDA education segments that we've done on the show. You can get to a whole list of those. Folks have told us that they love using them for education, especially when they're in mentor roles. They'll point students to these uh, segments, say, hey, Into Being's already talked about this. Why don't you go take a look? Those are free. Go use them. Go enjoy them. And this we will keep announcing as well. MEDC is going to be at Medical Device and Manufacturing West. Uh, that's in August in Anaheim, California. Looks like that will be back in person. Really exciting news there. Gigantic show. I've been to it before. Uh, not to be missed if you're a startup, if you're a, if you're a company looking for suppliers. MEDC is looking for folks in the optical instrument and lens manufacturing, electromedical and electrotherapeutic apparatus manufacturing, analytical laboratory instrument manufacturing, surgical and medical instrument manufacturing, surgical appliance and supplies manufacturing, dental equipment and supplies manufacturing, and ophthalmic goods manufacturing. They've got a deal for you. There's some grant funding available to get you uh, to that, to have you participate. They're hoping to host six small companies at the booth, targeting representation from different regions throughout the state. So Tino or Mark would love to get a note from you if you meet those qualifications. And uh, they would love to love to hear from you. So please use those emails right there and reach out. They want to find all these companies before June 1st. So go ahead and reach out to them. All right. With that, we are going to move over to the next segment of our show. Uh, if we can get the uh, if we can get the technology figured out right here. Here we go. It's always fun. Have Well, apologies for that, folks. We did have a little technical hiccup there that seems to have happened the last couple of weeks. We'll try to get that fixed. Um, appreciate the uh, comment from uh, our friend Karen, who uh, says uh, that she uses the catalog of regulatory training. It's great for those new to med devices. So thanks, Karen, for that uh, check-in in the chat. As always, you know, if you want to check in on the chat or in the Q&A, feel free to pop in. It is, it is um, Zoom, so you've got that opportunity. You can do that anytime you want to. Uh, as we're doing our show, if the question is relevant, we'll bring it to our guest um, and usually do a Q&A at the end. So don't hesitate. Speaking of guests, my guest today is John Freshly with Fresh Venture Development. And as we said before, many other entities, John is one who actually deserves the title of serial entrepreneur, having been part of many uh, uh, local startups. Um, he is currently the president and owner of Fresh Venture Development and co-founder and chairman of Bioscience Navigators. Um, I love how John says that he's focused on being helpful to scientists, founders, and or companies within the entrepreneurial ecosystems of Michigan and Portugal. And we're going to talk about that today as an advisor and or in interim leadership roles. Of course, he has names to his credit, such as ONL Therapeutics, Compendia Biosciences, he currently serves as executive chairman of Curio Genomics, head of corporate development with Acelix Bio. The list goes on and on. John, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. We're glad to have you. And that's not Michigan right behind you there. I confess it's not, especially when it's raining today. Uh, this <laughs> is uh, this is the walk to the beach in Portugal where uh, you know I like to think of it as my second office. 
after Gallup Park. So that's awesome, and uh, we're we're glad to have you in Michigan, and and we're interested to hear later today in the in the talk about um, how Portugal fits fits in both the family history and also. Um, in terms of similarities to some of the ecosystem things that we see around here. So that'll be really fun. I'd love to have you, John, though, just start by telling us a little bit about your career history and what has brought you to the passions that you have and to the moment that we're in today where you're, as you said, trying to be helpful to these, uh, these cool companies that we see all over the place. Well, sure. Um, you know, you didn't prepare for this, Gene, but uh, uh, I'm a trained actor and writer. Um, and, uh, that's how I, uh, it's a skill I, I, I've used over the last 20 years. I think I've certainly, I've been accused of using it from time to time. Um, but, uh, I started with a real passion for science. It was physics, uh, physics got really messy when it got quantum and, uh, you know, I knew biology from high school, which was really messy until it got molecular. And, uh, mm. so I really fell in love with molecular biology about 20 years ago when I got hired into my first biotech company. Um, and uh, I was hired because they couldn't find anyone qualified, uh, literally. I had no industry experience, but they needed someone to do business development. And, uh, uh, you know, and that's a little bit where Michigan was at the time. Um, you know, there were, there were people around, but no one crazy enough to join this company. And, uh, you know, early without uh, much funding. And uh, so, uh, you know, over the course of my career, I've uh, been unqualified for every job I've ever had. Um, but I love learning new things. I, uh, and I love learning new science more than anything. So uh, where I'm at today, I've kind of found a way where uh, I get to spend 90% of my time learning about cool stuff. And, uh, yeah, never been happier. Uh, I've probably uh, made a lot more money, but uh, who cares? Well, as you, I think some of the most qualified people I've ever met, they all uh, come, uh, someone on our team who coined the phrase, I have no idea what I'm doing, uh, even as she, you know, knocks them down and takes names the entire time. So I, it's, it's often a hallmark of folks that we love talking to who, uh, who admit what they do know and what they, don't, what they don't know. And it usually puts them in a position to see some really cool stuff over the course of their career. John, you told me that you had um, recently done sort of a reflection tour um, on some of the focuses of your career and the things that you're passionate about and want to share. How would you summarize your conclusions? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, it would, I, I resigned uh, my last CEO role uh, on the eve of my 50th birthday. Um, and I had opportunity to just rethink everything. And so I spent a summer uh, taking long walks, talking to a lot of people. Uh, exploring things outside of biotech, uh, you know, is I've got some other interests and skills, but came back to, you know, actually what I really love doing is getting involved in science that can impact patients. Um, and, and that's also my strength is thinking about early science. Um, and I don't enjoy uh, the phase that comes next where, you know, you're really trying to scale and, uh, you know, think about commercial, uh, you know, other than some of the tool companies I've done where the commercial thinking was, 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 was nice, but uh, I like pitching about three innings and, uh, you know, maybe setting it up for, uh, you know, for the next uh, leader to, you know, take the next steps, which, you know, have always been uncomfortable for me. I've kind of always thought I'd eventually learn how to do it. Uh, and I sort of did, but it's just so much less fun uh, for mm. me than you know, really the early conception of how do we take a technology and turn it into uh, a company that can optimize its you know, clinical potential. Mm. So that's you what described, I do now. You've described it to me as this place where translational business couples with translational science. And of course, we've talked many times with our friends at the different universities and tech transfer departments and translational entities. Um, and you, like, like ourselves, are, are, are outside of that system looking in, often looking at cool technologies. Um, you've used a phrase before, honoring the science as completely as we can. 
Um, but of course, as we know, looking in from the outside in this in this space, that like you said, it's it's between the the bare science, and it's also between the, that long term scale up where we just need to get this thing as cheap and make as much of it as we can. What does it mean to you to to honor the science while still looking at this translational development of a business? Yeah. So, you know. Uh, early on, you know, when we when I get the chance to look at science, you know, and sometimes the science is pretty well developed and there's a, a whole lot of data, but typically, uh, you know, that uh, scientific, you know, potential founder has been working on a question for up to 10 years and expanding the technology in a specific direction. That's how the funding cycle works. You know, you get a you get a grant to explore something new and then you get your next grant to build on it and build on it and build on it. Uh, but the core science, the core biology or the core technology platform uh, often can be you know, utilized in so many different ways. You know, and when I think about honoring the science, it's really meaning honoring the full potential and working with uh, the scientists to see that. You know, and I sort of describe it as, you know, the, uh, the scientist has picked, a, you know, developed a new color. You know, it's a it's a new shade of blue, mm -hmm. and they're painting a particular picture, but you haven't yet thought about all the other pictures that you can possibly paint with that same color. And when I have that engagement with science scientists, and again, for me, it becomes a, a love of the science and digging a little bit deeper. They get excited about that, um, and I think we're you know I've, I've seen some uh, you know fellow in investor, like folks, fellow uh, people like you involved in startups. Uh, I sometimes think we don't give the scientists enough credit for the ability to vision new things. Um, you know, I think it's just asking some questions and, and really truly uh, digging in and up to the science that you can talk about the science at a level of depth and thinking. Uh, and, and again, for me, it's really a very selfish activity because it's so much fun and I, I learned so much through that process. So it's really all about me. But to me, that's what translational business is, is about, is as the science is translating, it doesn't always translate in the directions we thought. It can translate in multiple directions. And thinking about how is that gonna create a business opportunity from that early beginning, rather than developing the science and then figuring out how are you going to get the business people involved to, to turn this into something, mm. throw it over the fence, you know, and then, and then we usually, you know, we, we have founders, founding C, CSOs uh, or advisors, but, you know, if they can, we limit their input often to the science and say, you know, yeah, they really understand the strategy or we got to go a different way on the strategy. Uh, and that becomes combative rather than partnering. So to me, it's also partnering with, with science, you know, truly, and figuring out the best way to, to work together. And I, the best relationships I've had over the last two decades is that scientific uh, co-founder, partner, whoever that, whatever my role is. It's interesting, John, we'll be talking later today about development iterations. And of course, that iterative process of product and company development starts all the way back at the stage that you're talking about. And I think what I, what I resonate with as you're saying that is we often look at it as sometimes from a, from a science standpoint, we can look at it as, oh, I solved this problem. This is the product that will emerge from that. And, and, and you're saying, no, that's not always the case. Sometimes it's really cool science, but a different product needs to emerge. But then other times business teams will say, thanks for the original idea, we'll take it from here, don't need you anymore. When in fact, the minds that thought of that, when we can all agree what the problem is that we're trying to solve, which requires a discovery and iterative process, those minds are still very important to have part of that because they knew the original technology and its maturation. So I just think that's a, it's a, it's a fun place in the process to be. It is, you know, and I think the piece to add on to that is, you know, Again, you know, what we're talking about today is, you know, a little bit some of the lessons I've learned so far. And every day I learn new ones. And I think we sometimes don't realize how much uh, the scientists can continue to learn about their own science. Uh, you know, none of these things are done and they want to learn more about their science if we give them that opportunity to really uh, continue to contribute in thinking about new directions. 
and, and, and in some cases, radical indirections. And they may know nothing, you know, they may have spent a, their career in oncology and know very little about immunology or uh, CNS. But, you know, I've never found one who wasn't interested in learning about it. Mm. You, so, you know, John, it's interesting. We, yeah. didn't, we didn't talk about this beforehand, but it, it does prompt me to, to wonder. We've seen um, academic co-founders of, of two different varieties, I would say. Uh, the ones who really are actually passionate about seeing their idea go all the way, and they don't mind sometimes even leaving the academic setting to go with the product. And then, of course, the company has the benefit of their uh, expertise all the way through that process. Others who have been in research for a long time, who have their routines, who want to do more of the same, they want to make uh, the academic progress on it, and that's just fine too. There's a ton of value in that. In, in some sort of a perfect world, in my mind, uh, maybe we would see more uh, folks who uh, sort of split that difference. And, and I think in theory, you know, universities will often give academic co-founders uh, some amount of time off to pursue those. What percentage of the time do you see that working out in that balance where the academic co-founder can really go forward and uh, continue their research in a healthy way that lets the company also move forward? Do you have any, have you any insights on that? I guess my only insight is I don't think it matters. Mm. That part, it's not the amount of time, it's the amount of, uh, you know, I'm going to say emotional commitment. Mm. Um, so, you know, if the attitude is, I want to let this go so I can do something else, and that's okay, I guess, but I think it's actually hard at the beginning to have a, a founder, uh, scientist. it's really not a scientific partnership, but I've had great partnerships with 20% free time and a full-time job, usually it's 20% after time, um, or 100%. And it, it really, I think, is a, a mindset and a commitment to that piece of science, even though they may have other science that they're pursuing. Mm. That's a good perspective, just the willingness there, how it turns out. Yeah. You know, on the flip side, I've also seen 100% commitments or 100% time commitments that aren't 100% uh, emotional commitments. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, people who like the idea of doing a startup. But is it really, are you really committed to that science? Uh, or you know, this is the only way I can find funding for this startup, for, for my science. Like this is a funding opportunity, not actually a taking this to clinical impact opportunity. I just want to keep my research going. Mm. So seen it both sides. Yeah, that's really cool. Your, your, um, your point about seeing uh, the, the, the color blue, the color blue has many uses and someone may say, well, this is the use that I see for the color blue. We've got a, a great legacy um, of companies in Ann Arbor that have, that have sort of had to make those kind of pivots and, and done well by doing them, by recognizing that the color blue right. was good for more than, than we thought. We were chatting offline about uh, David Olson um, and Jen Baird with, uh, with accuracy cytometers as, the, as that progressed through many uh, different um, ideas and, and iterations, but um, a success nevertheless. Absolutely. Yeah. Open, open mind is an asset. Yeah. Well, as you are looking at helping companies um, in these many different roles, and I'll have you talk in a, in a little bit about the different roles that you have and, um, you know, who, who should be reaching out to you and which role to, to talk about which, uh, which thing. But you have a very interesting perspective on uh, when you approach an idea and a company, you try to think about a few different things because, I mean, everybody's baby is beautiful, right? Like everyone thinks their baby is beautiful. I just posted a picture of my baby at the beginning of the, <laughs> at the, beginning of the show. Right, but right, right. Those of us who've seen a lot, of, um, a lot of startups and a lot of ideas, especially early stage, we know that some things have to be present and We've talked about many of those on the show, but you've, you and I, when we were talking, you had some very interesting perspectives on um, how much innovation could be present, how many innovations we're willing to bite off in one chunk if we're truly to be successful. Yeah, I may need to, you to clarify a little bit, but I'll take a stab at, at, at what I think you're, you're aiming for um, is, uh, you know, there's, well, there's certainly a lot 
beyond the technical innovation, the scientific innovation. Uh, when I think about building these things, you know, and, and certainly it's, it, it is always interesting how, you know, scientists trained deeply in science and statistics uh, forget about, you know, that things uh, tend to come back to the mean. So not all ideas can be that brilliant. Um, you, you know, we need to be honest and take a look hard. And, you know, also, again, it's not, is it the technology or is it the application? You know, where, where are we regressing to the mean potentially? Uh, so if we can take it in a new uh, direction, we, we can uh, really excel and, and, and beat the odds, right? Because the odds are not good in this industry. The odds are awful in this industry. But I also think that um, you know, early at conception, we think about the technology is what we're selling. And you know, we can go all the way back to, uh, to Jeffrey Moore, you know, probably five decades now, uh, and the idea of uh, crossing the chasm and the whole product. And the whole product for these early stage companies is the investment story. That's what we're selling. And so if we think about the whole product, it's the technology, but it's the technology plus. It's the technology plus the team that's going to be able to execute it. It's the, it's the technology plus all of the inherent risks and which of those risks have been able to be uh, reduced. They're never going to go away. But which of those have been, been mitigated? Because most technology investors are willing to take one risk. In, in the drug development space, they're willing to take the risk on the clinical trial as long as you've reduced all the others. You know, they're willing to take that one risk. So that's part of the whole product is understanding that and making sure everyone understands that. Um, so, you know, I, again, that's sort of, uh, if that was what you're getting at, I think, you know, that's a perspective, but investors know that things regress to the mean. So you, you, you gotta make sure that you're addressing what's truly differentiated and what, you know, whether you truly have uh, a high probability of success and not everyone can have a high probability of success. Yeah, I think it was interesting when you and I were chatting previously, you made the point that, yeah, all these different factors are here. And that's something that we all talk about, right? Like which, which factors are at play and often surprises entrepreneurs how many factors are at play. And, and you just reiterated those for us. I, I found it fascinating when you uh, mentioned how, how risk averse investors can be that they don't want to bite all the risks off. They do have to be mitigated. So to walk in and say, I know what all the risks are, isn't the same as saying, I know what all the risks are, or at least the ones I know about. And here's why they're mostly mitigated, but here is the one we're focusing on. In your experience, are there risks that investors are more willing to take with a startup and ones that they're less willing to take with Absolutely. a startup? Absolutely. Absolutely, they're 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 willing to take the risk of an experiment, in my opinion. Or, you know, again, I and I'm really talking about uh, you know R and D opportunities rather than commercial opportunities, right? You know, and again, uh, a lot of other investors are perfectly happy to take the, the commercial risk. Like that's great news. You you've got a minimal viable product, and we'll take the commercial risk. That's what we like to invest in. And especially on the biotech side, it's it's people are willing to invest in the first clinical trial, the, the mm. human proof of concept that, that has been well-designed, you know, it has a, a reasonable probability of testing your clinical hypothesis. And they don't want any of the others to come into play. They don't want, you know, teams that are inexperienced. They don't want teams that don't get along well. They don't want, there's a lot of things that, that they want to avoid. Um, they want to avoid regulatory risk. So have you really thought about the, the appropriate path that, again, you never have a guarantee what the FDA is going to say, right? But there are certain things you can do to increase the probabilities of success, and and that's what you you know that's what investors like. Um, and they you know very few investors are actually passionate about the problem you're solving. Now, again, I'm, and that really represents institutional investors versus a lot of angel investors. Angel investors are often super passionate about the problem you're solving. And they're often willing to take more than one risk because of that. That's great. Well, I want to take you to the place behind you, John. Sure. <laughs> Portugal. <laughs> Me um, too. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's where we all want to be. Um, yeah, I miss it. I miss it. 
When was the last time you were able to go? And actually, in the in the process, maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, about uh, how how the link came up to Portugal. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm half Portuguese, although um, I had not visited for 37 years uh, until about 10 years ago. Uh, I uh, first at the one time I went there, I was five years old. The day uh, my family landed, my grandfather passed away but it had actually been an awesome day went to a bullfight you know it was super cool and um and i actually only have good memories of that week but i didn't go back for 37 years and uh and then when i went back i just i fell in love with the country my cousins the people you know i've got 250 cousins around the country i got to the point where they were starting to introduce cousins to each other that had never met um and you know, two years ago when I was on my reflection tour, you know, I asked a question I had sort of been asking in the back of my mind for many years is could I do in Portugal what I do here mm. uh, in Michigan? And I, you know, I, I ran an experiment and the outcome of that experiment was absolutely. The science is terrific. Uh, sometimes uh, the uh, ecosystem is underappreciated in, in the world don't realize how much great science is, 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 is here. Um, and, you know, and it turns out we have the same population, uh, Michigan and Portugal. We have the, ex Portugal is the exact same land mass as the lower peninsula. Uh, we both have big bridges, um, you know, and we both have long coastlines. Ours is longer here in Michigan, but they have better waves. And so, you know, it was a very similar place, except that anyone born uh, anyone my age that was born in Portugal uh, grew up in a dictatorship. So, you know, the idea of capital, private capital and entrepreneurship is, is new. Uh, it's only, you know, a generation and a half old. Um, so that's an ingredient that, 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 that hasn't been present in Portugal, but it also has reminded me of what happened when I arrived in Michigan in 1999 mm. and someone was desperate enough to hire me. Uh, truly, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, we've seen such an amazing progress uh, in, in, in access to capital and access to talent. To some extent, thankfully, Pfizer and pharmacy are closed. What a, an incredible opportunity for the region and mm. we've taken it, I think. Um, and, you know, so I, I see Portugal is a couple decades behind, but with the same potential that I see in Michigan, which continues to grow. And it continues to get more recognized as a place to do things like we like to do. That's huge. And you had made some comparisons in terms of land mass and in terms of population and everything else. And you wouldn't think of a, of a country like Portugal that had gone see, through so much politically as being a place where that potential would be there. And yet maybe the potential is even greater, right? Because you're, you're dealing with some place where people are hungry to get these kinds of uh, innovations out there. Yeah, I mean, the th enthusiasm is incredible. And I actually, you know, there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of enthusiasm. But, but when I gave a talk there, I, I asked a, a group of about 100 people, how many people have been at biotech? And a lot of hands went up. How many people have been in two? About 10. By the time I got to three, the answer was zero. You know, and at the time I got to share that I failed six times. You know, I've, I've learned a few things. Um, and, uh, you know, and that makes a difference, but, uh, you know, I see the same energy and enthusiasm, uh, coming out uh, of our universities in Michigan, but we are again, at, at sort of the danger of having a generation gap. Uh, the Pfizer generation is getting old, old, you know, like me. Right. And we haven't had a lot of that next generation of leadership growing up. We've had jobs, we've had sort of staff level uh, positions. But we are lacking, especially in life science, and I, I can't, you know, or in biotech, I can't speak as much to, to the other uh, subsectors. But in biotech, we've had fewer, we have, you know, I got my first CEO job when I was uh, still in my 30s, and we don't see a lot of biotech CEOs in their 30s. And so, you know, again, when I think about being helpful, it's a lot of mentorship, you know, and I, I really want to work with not only these uh, these technologies, but with the people who are going to be the, the future of Michigan life science. 
It's a great call to action, John, because I think we get complacent in any generation where we are. And I know, you know, you referred to the Pfizer and Pharmacia um, changes as being as being good things. That's the vision of someone who says, of course, things are going to change. What new opportunities has this created for us? And I, I see you now sort of saying, we made good on those on those opportunities. But that's not going to th that potential isn't going to be there forever because that generation is is going away. So what's the next? What's the next thing? What's the big disruptive thing that's going to allow us to to leap into the future? Yeah. Any vision? Any even, vision for what that is? Well, again, I'm I, I'm I'm not convinced that we need something disruptive like that. Mm. And I, you know, in many ways, I know that was impactful on a, a, a lot of people in ways that were hugely uncomfortable. Um, but it, it, it created a platform which we need to continue to develop, right? Mm -hmm. So it actually, in that sense, you know, we have an opportunity to be a little bit more evolutionary than disruptive. There will be other things that will certainly be disruptive. Um, but if it, I think if we're kind of aggressive in our mentorship and our recruiting people back to Michigan and we have enough of an ecosystem so that people can fail and still stay in Michigan, again, you know, what are the things that you need for people to, to take, a, take a risk on Michigan, right? Mm. That's an entrepreneurial risk right there. If you're coming from San Francisco or Boston or you know, one of these hotspots, you know, you're taking a personal risk, not only in the science, but on Michigan itself. Um, and, you know, how can we mitigate that risk for people and how can we make sure that the mentors are going to be there and the other opportunities are going to be there. And so I think we have an opportunity to not be disruptive in this talent meet. Mm, just to continue to grow what has already been started from that earlier disruption. Yeah, there's, there's so many good raw ingredients that, that have been here. And, you know, and again, we've got young energy, young enthusiasm, the science you know, the scientists I engage with that are young uh, are so creative and the science, the science they're learning and developing is so far advanced that, you know, we just got to give them an excuse to stick around here and learn from these elder statesmen we have now in the community that, you know, are, didn't move with Pfizer to the coast for a reason because they love this community and mm. they would love to contribute. And, and, you know, and we see that, I see Jim Arthur is on the call, you know, Jim is an amazing mentor to the next generation. And uh, I'm sure there's others, you know, again, I haven't seen the whole list here, but, uh, you know, it's the type of spirit we have in this community. And we, I think we just need to find some ways to, to, to capture that in a, some sort of systematic way. Mm. There was a question here and I want to, I want to address it specifically. David had asked um, about sure. a local university system uh, working to build a campus-based entrepreneurial ecosystem, bring in successful alumni and mentors and connect it to students and faculty. And specifically for that kind of a situation where a university maybe hasn't had that, and of course many in the state have, have, have been working on those for a long time, and as new ones come online and say, yes, we, we want to do this really hyper-locally and, and have this available, uh, what advice do you give during the transition of building the technology versus launching the enterprise to commercialize the solution? How, if you, if you could do this from scratch with a new university ecosystem, what would be your first thoughts? Yeah, I think one of the, well, uh, you know, I'll say something really opinionated that I've had for about 20 years is the metric I hate the most in tech transfer offices and within the state is number of mm. companies started. Mm. So when I think about commercialization, is a company the right answer? Is a company the right answer for one technology at a time? Or should we early on think about how do we bring in additional technologies? Because in a company that reduces risk, right? You've got multiple ways to win. Um, so I think that's a big deal. And, you know, and again, don't assume a company's the right path. Often, you know, we, uh, we want to encourage these technologies through tech transfer to get out to a, to, uh, to a company, especially if the, if the scientist has interest, but we don't actually fully explore sometimes what are the license opportunities? Cause I've, I've never met a scientist who hasn't wanted to maximize the clinical impact of their invention. So really thinking a very open mind very early before 
too much emotional and early capital has been invested in this idea of we're going to have a startup company. We've actually launched one and we've raised 2 million of seed capital. Really hard to turn back at that point, mm. you know, unless that was part of the plan, right? Unless we were going to say, oh, and we're going to merge into something bigger. You know, that's fine. But try to, you know, it's almost like uh, you can get these things to run faster if you move a little bit slower early on and you, you know, you, and you get enough investment. Because I think the other piece to this is we're good at getting advisors, but advisors can't dig in enough to really partner. So, I, I mean, I think this, again, I, I don't think you're looking at a two-year commitment from someone like me, but, you know, maybe a three-month commitment to like spend half my time, 100% of my time on, on one of these projects. And I'm happy to do that. I won't do anything full-time or, you know, generally or uh, long-term, but I love getting deep enough into a project that I can, you know, actually come out of that and say, I don't think it's going to work or this really might work. We should, we should really take next steps. That for me is fun coming to that answer. The color blue should be used over here and not here. <laughs> yeah. Or you know what? Ditch the color blue. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes there's that no is place. the right answer. Right. There's no place for it in this painting. That's for sure. You know, this whole conversation, and, and thank you, David, for the question and John for the answer. Um, it makes yeah. me think, I've noticed over the years that some of our uh, university systems have some unique strengths. I think of uh, University of Michigan being exceptionally powerful in the research dollars and in the amount of IP generated. I think of our friends over at Spectrum Health being really, really good at getting inside the hospital system and finding out what's happening um, I've found our friends down at Notre Dame, right outside the uh, state of Michigan, um, being really good at taking business school students and shoving them right onto startup problems. And the list goes on and on and on. Uh, maybe that's something we need to do one of these days is do a survey of, uh, of different strengths of these systems so that we can all learn from each other. Uh, but this is, uh, yeah. this is really cool. John, I want to have you take just a couple yeah, minutes I'll here. Oh, go also, ahead. Can I add one? Yeah, thing to absolutely. It? Just to, to give a shout out because, you know, University of Michigan gets a lot of attention deservedly. But one of the pleasures of the last two years is, you know, discovering how much great science is outside the University of Michigan mm. uh, in the other institutions. Um, and it just takes a little uh, more work and looking and but, you know, we've got founders, uh, scientists at Wayne State, at Michigan State that I've had deep interactions with that are so willing to, to listen and partner and be coached and teach me. And, uh, you know, we underappreciate, I think, some of the other Michigan assets and we sort of do it, you know, politically, we got to let everyone play. The reality is, is there's great stuff uh, everywhere. And I sort of say innovation is everywhere. It's not exclusive to any one geography or any one institution. Um, yeah, that's, and that's we very true. Appreciate that at times. And we see it out of uh, both our, our other universities, like you said, Michigan State, Lawrence Tech, uh, others, as well yeah. as um, other hospital systems. I think it's, it's really cool because we see um, hospital systems that are dealing with patients every day and problems, and then they say, hey, we need something here, and they're entering that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I know Oakland and Beaumont, you know, have you know really strong relationships, and uh, and there's great science there too. I just I haven't had enough input, you know experience with it, but I can't wait to. So, anyway. John, this has been phenomenal. I want to give you just one minute to tell us just a little bit about some of your initiatives, so that people know uh, how or why to get uh, in touch with you uh, before we close the interview down. Sure. Well, I mean. The big initiative is, uh, you know, and I'm dedicated for the next 20 years, probably longer, to trying to have an impact primarily on drug development in Michigan, because that's my strength in many ways, but I also do some genomics, uh, and in Portugal. So I might split my time. Um, but, you know, the primary question is, you know, can I be helpful? And I've sort of said I, I, I always uh, work on sliding scale, uh, like one of my therapists in the past, that was from uh, zero to a lot, depending on ability to pay. So I, I hardly ever turn down uh, an opportunity to chat, uh, only if I'm way too busy. And uh, so the only reason to reach out for me is if you're interested in having a chat that could end up being helpful and interesting to both of us, because you know I just want to learn cool stuff. Well, that's awesome. We've learned a few cool things today, John. Uh, maybe I'll have to reach back out to you when we want to do this little survey of uh, 
of translational stuff. We, it'd be kind of fun to highlight some of the strengths around the state. That'd be a fun, uh, fun activity. Absolutely. It'd, uh, it'd be a pleasure. Well, thanks right. so much for having me on. John Freshley, thanks for being with us today. You bet. All right, and with that, if we can, we're just having a beautiful day with technology here. It must be the uh, sleep deprivation. Hopefully this will get us over to where we want to be. There it is. May is Medical Device Development Month at MedTech Crossroads. In fact, we started just in the month of April. We had our first segment. We've got a few different ones that we're talking about, all about development. Last week, we talked about the concept of it's compelling, but does it work? how we're discovering unknowns and unknown unknowns and solving them because development is really a matter of finding those unknowns and solving them. Something that John was just talking about, about his interest in these early stage ideas. Next, today we're going to talk about the real meaning of development iteration. Kind of a flashy title, but everyone's familiar with doing iterations on a product and yet no one seems to understand when is an iteration a good idea? When is it a bad idea? When am I saving time? When am I wasting time? Why can't I just go there all in one big step? Because it's all related to the question we're all asking in product development, which is, are we there yet? I've got kids and sometimes they in the car say, are we there yet? And everybody in a startup in a new product development effort wants to know, when did we get to the goal or when will we get to the goal? But we have to ask this question, where is there? This is a challenge. We need to understand what the actual target is because visualizing the goal is easy, but understanding the details of the goal can be very, very hard. And so when we start a new effort, it's easy in broad strokes to say, this is where we wanna to get to. The whole process of development is to break that down into bite-sized chunks, each one of which needs to be solved, needs to be addressed, and they all have to be addressed by the same product. So a product that addresses 50% of its goals hasn't succeeded yet. You have to meet all of the goals that are actually critical to product success, as we like to talk about, obviously, minimum viable product. That one product has to address all of those minimum goals. New product development is really like multiple simultaneous equations for those of you who uh, didn't hate math. You have to solve them all. It could be things like cost targets, safety, manufacturability, the adoption rate and process for your target market, the runway that you have in front of you, the valuation of your company. Is my product biocompatible? Oh, I made it work, but it's, it's not safe for the patient. Is it safe? Is it efficacious? Is it usable? You've heard us talk about all of these components, all of these individual equations. And yet what we sometimes miss is that for a product to be truly finished, to be truly on the market, it in itself needs to solve all of these equations. How does it get there? How does it make its way through that process to that solution? Well, to talk about that, we need to talk about the word prototype. And this has been a longstanding passion of ours at Into Being, because not only do we do FDA submissions, but we also do FDA packages. And before that, we do a lot of development work where we're actually making prototypes. And a lot of confusion can enter the picture here, because what is this prototype prototypical of? Is it the prototype that's just gonna demonstrate something in a dog and pony sense? Is this prototype gonna allow us to go to human clinical trials? Or is it our actual manufacturable prototype that's gonna go all the way to the market? Perhaps it's just a subpart of the product that's allowing us to test some aspect of it. But when you hear the word prototype, something probably goes through your head. When your investor hears the word prototype, something probably goes through their head. When your manufacturer hears the word prototype, something else probably goes through their head. And so this one word has to stand in for many, many different stages of product iteration. And so we assign terms to it. We'll say alpha prototype or beta prototype or conceptual prototype or manufacturing prototype or production ready prototype. 
And it's important to distinguish what level of iteration we're actually at so that we know what we're talking about and what expectations we should have about it. Now, in a perfect world, your first prototype would meet the cost targets, it would fit your budget and your runway, it would already be set for reimbursement, it would be manufacturable, it would be usable, et cetera. It's a very short list standing in for a very long list. But in the real world, prototypes solve groups of targets and they mature towards meeting all of the targets. To miss this is to miss the essence of development. What we talked about last week is that development is a process by which we learn from where we were to move to where we need to be. We have to go through that process. And although you haven't seen us talk about it this way, loops inside even the FDA development process are there. If my design output doesn't verify the way I want it to with my inputs, or if I discover along the way that my inputs weren't quite right, I need to loop back. If my design reviews discover that something was missed or that something should have been a little bit different, there's a loop back that happens. We don't like to get to validation and have loop backs happen, but inevitably as a product matures through its life cycle, even validation aspects may have to be repeated as the product changes. So loops are common, they're normal, iterations have to happen as new needs and requirements are discovered and old needs are solved. We were talking with our team and we were, got this wonderful uh, quote from one of our team members about the early stage part of development. Getting simple concepts as soon as possible is much better than making time intensive detailed designs. Generate concept sketches or simple CAD models and renderings first. Sometimes the client says one thing is critical, then only when they see a concept realize they want something different. So now we're hearing this idea that sometimes smaller iterations can be better when you're expecting to discover an unknown inside that iteration, when you think that's what's actually gonna happen. And this always set expectations. What is this iteration solving? If we do a product and we use representative materials for this iteration, well, it shouldn't come as a surprise that the final materials haven't been picked. That's what this iteration is not solving. And so I'd encourage your development team to ask, what are you solving with this product iteration? And what are you not solving with it? Both of those are equally important. Also ask this question, why not combine other endpoints in this iteration? If we did, we could learn more quickly. Sometimes that's valid. Other times, the question should be, why are we combining so many endpoints in this iteration? Well, in fact, if you combine too many, you won't know what you learned if the iteration fails. And this is the balance of selecting the right size of an iteration. If you can combine variables that you can solve, well, go ahead and do it as long as you're not putting so many in there that when the result comes back in an unfavorable way, you won't have gotten anything out of that iteration. And this is something that your whole team uh, should be involved in. Your whole team should be asking, what is to our mutual benefit in this process? Well, this raised an interesting question, and I'm actually going to uh, stop the share here and, uh, and open up and bring someone else on, a special uh, guest today. But with this question, are fewer iterations uh, better? And what we're going to do is we're going to end the show and stop the share here so I can get back uh, to do a, a share. And hopefully this uh, this just worked with us here. We're enjoying also technical difficulties today. Let's see if that worked. Did we get Keegan? Hey, Gene. Hey, everybody. There's Keegan MacArthur, one of our developers here at Into Being. And as we we're reaching out to our team for this little segment on iterations, Keegan wrote me back and he said uh, on our on our uh, group chat, he said. I noticed that you that you mentioned that fewer iterations are better. And of course, sometimes we're thinking from the investor's standpoint, we're thinking from the management standpoint, I want to get there in as few iterations as I can. But Keegan, I always appreciate it when people say, that's the wrong question. 
And you made some interesting uh, citations about things that we've heard in the news, uh, not medical devices, but other cool tech, where maybe more iterations were better. Tell us what your thoughts were. Yeah, that iterations, uh, it always makes me think of SpaceX, mm. actually. I think, uh, you know, obviously I have, I have limited information. I have no more information than anybody else, but man, I really, I look at them and I think, wow, there is a company that's doing it right. Mm. Uh, and mm, you might think, mm, hang on, don't they, don't they blow up a lot of rockets? Mm. Don't, they, don't they have a lot of failed test flights? Well, I would argue, no, they don't. Uh, they've converted a lot of money and materials into information. Mm. Uh, they have, uh, you know, it's, it's only a failure if you fail to learn from it. And, and so, it's interesting because a lot of those things where it ended in an explosion, they actually got that thing back near the ground where they never had before. It came into the pad where it never had before. Oh, it touched down, but then exploded where it never had before. And you're seeing that progression. I like your analogy, converting uh, money into information. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great concept. Um, and I don't know if you have any, uh, any comments for us in our audience in terms of um, how you like to establish iterations or what sorts of, you know, from, and, and Keegan does a bunch of uh, CAD and design and assembly work for us, so the comments would be limited to that. But what, um, how do you know if an iteration is too big or too small? What, what, when does your gut say we're not in the right spot? Mm, I think, I mean, it does get back to what you're talking about with, uh, you know, how many variables are you packing into the experiment? Mm. Uh, if you got so many in there that, yeah, you, you can't really determine what went wrong and what to do about it, it's probably probably a few too many, but I like to work off of feature lists. You know, we'll talk with a client and we'll say, well, what does the thing need to do? We'll get a list from that. And then you go through the design process and you try to create the simplest design you can that ticks all the boxes. And then once you've got that, uh, you might, you know, do a design review and make sure, you know, get some second opinions, make sure the client wants to uh, proceed with, uh, with making a prototype. But uh, once, uh, once you've kind of got that minimum design that ticks the boxes, just make it, try it. Uh, it'll be ugly. <laughs> it'll be basic. It's, uh, it's not going to be the final thing, but uh, real life is the best simulator in the world. Uh, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you're you're going to learn so much more from, uh, from actually making it and trying it, generally speaking, than you will from sitting there and thinking about it harder or running another FEA or you know, whatever else. And uh, yeah, then make sure you learn from it, take that data and go through the design process again. That's great. Well, Keegan, I appreciate your popping in um, in the middle of the day here and, uh, and joining us for this, but I really appreciated your question, the pushback that said, hey, Gene, hold on, iterations are not a bad thing. It's a question <laughs> of right sizing the iterations. So we greatly appreciated that and I appreciate you popping on now. Well, thank you, Gene. Have a good one all. And we'll finish up with the last slide of our summary here of the presentation. And that is this. In summary, iterations are necessary to solve all requirements simultaneously in one product. You're not going to get away from them. You can waste iterations by doing too much in an iteration so that you don't know what you've learned. You can also do too little in an iteration when you could have done more. So everyone on the team should be united in right-sizing each iteration to get to the goal quickly. And this is interesting. Your management team and your funders don't win by minimizing iterations because if the product doesn't work, it's not gonna be a win. But your developers don't win by maximizing the iterations and creating as much luxury as possible. Everyone wins by reaching the goal quickly. And that's what should be the goal of iterative product development. So with that, We'll stop that share and we'll open it back up for any questions, comments, or community announcements that may be uh, out there. And if we have any hands raised in the, uh, in the Zoom window, we will bring those on. Uh, not seeing any of those though. We do have one. Oh, do we have one there, Steve? Thank you. Steve's always there to, to get my back. Uh, what do we have here? Let's see what we got. We've got one hand raised. Our friend Ken Spencer, you are live with us. 
Gene, so first of all, congratulations to Samuel on his new parents. <laughs> Thank you. Out there. But uh, also for John, if he's still on, you know, um, one of the aspects that Steve Blank always brings up is the issue that some of these larger companies that we try and license things to are not interested until we've got traction in the marketplace, which has, I think, forced some of the issues of, you know, doing startups. You know, that, that being said, I've always had this concept of what I call a, rather a commercialator as opposed to a, an accelerator, which I think U of M really is, right? Where the commercialator could take several different products to mitigate risks to your point, and, but have a common management because not every particular uh, you know, develop, project could afford a, a CFO, CFO, FDA guy, and things like that. So I've always been trying to push this concept of d developing a commercial later, you know, as a next step. Yeah, that's great. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, over the past two years, I'm involved with two of those. One is Bioscience Navigators, which is a, a, a company that Scott Olson and I have uh, put together, which is all about being able to work with some of the tech transfer offices and have the opportunity to provide an early common management team. Um, you know, and, and you know, one of the key benefits there is, you know, especially early on is, you know, we don't have such a deep stake in any of these things that, uh, you know, we can't go away. When you have a full-time CEO, CFO, uh, they've got some job security to worry about. Uh, you know, we always have another project that we can pull in uh, to, to, to develop. So we're a lot more agnostic early on. And the other group I'm working with is a venture partner is Orange Grove Bio that's really trying to do this at a big scale. And we've launched two companies in, in the last year, uh, one out of University of Michigan, uh, the other out of Cornell Weill uh, in New York. Uh, and there's about uh, four more in the pipeline. And again, it's all about trying to provide, uh, uh, you know, resources uh, at an appropriate level for the stage of development. And at some point, yeah, you need the full-time team and, and maybe the, the team is actually built around multiple of these assets. Uh, so yeah, uh, uh, you know, I love the, the concept and it wasn't mine, but as soon as I became aware of it, it was like, how do we do this here? And again, you know, what I'm doing with Bioscience Navigators compared to Orange Grove is I'm trying to do it even earlier. I'm trying to get things ready for an Orange Grove-like company. And there's there's a whole plethora of these in the drug development space. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, and again, I'm just not aware of how this is being done in other spaces, but it makes perfect sense to me. Uh, so yeah, love it. And uh, you're, yeah. I gotta, you're a fa have a fan. Yeah, and also part of the issue with many of the things that we work with over in you know, medical school is that the, the clinicians are clinicians for a reason. You know, they really, they don't wanna leave, right? They're, I mean, they have, a, they have a passion and a full-time job for what they do. So there needs to be, and there's only so many Gen Bairds, you know, out in the world, right? That are taking stuff on. So this, this idea of being able to collectively move some things that have some commonality to them, you know, in, into, you know, an entity, I think is, is going to be really important for us to move stuff forward. Yeah. And, you know, just to speak to that, uh, you know, especially in environments like, like Michigan and Portugal that, uh, you know, have a underpopulation of crazy people, which I sort of describe as people like Jen and I, um, so, you know, we need to sort of leverage these resources uh, across more great, great science, great technologies. Um, and, uh, you know, that's what I hope to, to be doing for the next 20 years. That's great, Ken. Thank you for the comment. John, thanks for popping back in. You bet. All right. And with that, we're past the top of the hour. I'll leave it open for 30 seconds in case there's any other questions, comments, or community announcements. As you know, we'd love to let folks know about what uh, you know that's going on in the community. Raise that hand if you've got anything. Otherwise, we are going to wrap the show and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Everything in May is going to be about development alongside our guests as always. And the last show of this month, we're going to have our community judges back on to talk to us 
about what they don't like when they see a startup. We won't talk about specific startups, but we're going to ask, what do you hate when you see it? So that'll be a fun show at the last uh, day of the month, the last uh, Friday of the month. Other than that, thanks for being with us on MedTech Crossroads. We'll see you next week.